As we gather here today, we acknowledge we are on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. We pay our respects to the First Nation and Métis ancestors of this place and reaffirm our relationship with one another. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Keith Willoughby. I'm the Interim Dean at the Edwards School of Business. And it's my pleasure today to welcome you to the 10th presentation in the Gordon and Maureen Haddock Entrepreneurial Speaker Series. So, wonderful. I am pleased to see so many of you in attendance today and are grateful for your uh, participation with us for what should be an absolutely wonderful session for today's Entrepreneurial Speaker Series. I have the pleasure of introducing Gord and Maureen Haddock. Gordon and Maureen are very good friends of the Edwards School of Business, both graduates of the University of Saskatchewan. Gordon is a graduate with his Bachelor of Commerce degree. Maureen is a graduate of the College of Education. But both the Haddocks demonstrate the ability and the willingness to pay it forward. Through the good work that they do, through the contribution of their time and their talents, through basically being able to share their talents with one another, they build a stronger place for all of us here. They are true entrepreneurs. They have developed this speaker series as a way of representing a truly fitting topic for us in this province. They began the speaker series in 2007, and each year we have the good fortune of hearing from a variety of individuals who can share their stories of entre entrepreneurial success with all of us. Gordon and Maureen are donors to the school. They are both members of the Edwards Dean Circle. I will say on a personal note how absolutely wonderful it is, and a bit of trivia here. Did you know that in the year 2016, Maureen, in the category of top 100 books sold in 2016 uh, in Saskatchewan, Maureen's book, With Love from Iraq, finished fourth out of all books in fiction and nonfiction sold in the province of Saskatchewan. She finished ahead, ahead, mind you, of Bleeding Blue, giving all for the game by Wendell Clark. She beat <laughs> Wendell Clark, another Saskatchewan success story. Of course, you may have heard the person that finished first in the list, this J.K. Rowling, who wrote something called Harry Potter. But I figure if you can beat Wendell Clark and finish fourth to Harry Potter's author, you've done quite well. So ladies and gentlemen, it's my pleasure to introduce you Gordon and Maureen Haddock, who will uh, welcome you and then provide an introduction to Brian and Evan. So Haddocks, welcome. Thank you, Gordon. Welcome. Well, for a new guy, you're doing pretty good. Yeah? It's almost like you're trying to get the job full time. <laughs> um, I just wanted to thank everybody for coming, um, and our goal is not numbers, but just interest, because if we can get one entrepreneur inspired, then we've succeeded. So we don't care if one comes, one person shows up, or a hundred, or a thousand. If we can create a Brian and Evan story, then we've succeeded. So unlike the internet where, sorry, <laughs> it's a call. Hello? Yes. <laughs> uh, uh, unlike the internet where somebody says, I've got a thousand friends, we're not interested in that. We don't really care. We just want the people who are interested to show up. Uh, and I, as I look around the room, I see some people who have been here, not in this room for 10 years, but showed up for the 10 speakers. I see my old business partner, Ralph, back there. He, uh, you, you have attended 10, I think, 10 for 10. Yeah, it's pretty good for an old guy to be able to figure out how to get here uh, <laughs> every year on the right bus. But, uh, <laughs> and I know Lee has been here, uh, I think, just well. And Marv, you've been here just well. I think there's a lot of 10-year veterans here. So we must be doing right, something right as people keep coming back. Uh, there is one person that we'd like to thank that isn't here, and that is Jan Kalinowski. Jan has organized all these events for this past 10 years, but she's organized anything we've done for, well, 20, 
25 years, I can't remember, a long time, and she just retired and is probably happy somewhere on a beach or something. So, <laughs> But she's passed the, the bag of problems to Nicole, so we'll uh, maybe work with Nicole for the next 10 or 20 years, who knows, she's young. <laughs> uh, so not only is this event special because it's our 10th, but it's also the 20th anniversary of our entrepreneurial uh, scholarship. And it's also the 25th year that Maureen and I have tried to get entrepreneurism as a major in the College of Commerce. <laughs> uh, we, <laughs> we, we have started in the mid-90s uh, with Dean Brennan, then Dean Pearson, then Dean Ax uh, Isaac, then Acting Dean Dobney, then Dean Taurus, and now Acting Dean Willoughby. And uh, we're pleased to find out from, the de from Dean Willoughby, and I'm going to read this, that the Edwards Executive has decided to make our undergraduate entrepreneurship class a core course. Yes, yes. <laughs> uh, this, this means that this course, previously taught to about 80 students, per year will now have an annual enrollment of 450. <laughs> yes, which is a big. And they anticipate that this will take effect in 2018-2019. And uh, if you ever go to our website, there's one of my favorite quotes by Calvin Coolidge, and I won't say it all, but the first line is, nothing in the world can take the place of persistence. So if you're dealing with the university, <laughs> yeah, be prepared. It's not a quick battle. <laughs> We're still waiting to decide what color for the washroom on the arts tower on the third floor. That's, <laughs> that's only been in process for 10 years, but we're expecting an answer soon. So, uh, Now Maureen and I are on another mission, and that is to promote the verbal skills communication skills of the students. Uh, we feel that students are losing their uh, ability to have direct verbal communication with people, especially people they don't know. And we're not saying uh, that technology is bad, uh, but it's only a small part of the communication process. And we're not saying that successful people have great interpersonal skills, communication skills, but we kind of bet that 80 to 90 percent of successful people do. And that may be a great thing to study. Is there a relationship between your ability to talk to people? So what we hope people would do, especially students, is put the phones down, stop texting, and start talking to the person beside you. Uh, because who knows that person on the plane or at the Husky game or the, li the lineup at McDonald's, they may be the key to your success. And if you're too busy doing this, you'll never, you'll never uh, get that opportunity. And sometimes you'd be surprised who is sitting beside you if you ever talk to them. So our guest speakers are living example of what can happen when you employ these types of verbal skills. As mentioned by the Dean, they're both U of S grads. Uh, uh, Brian, of course, of Commerce, and Evan, he's an honorary Commerce guy. We, we j just made him that so he could come here today. But they have just started their entrepreneurial journey, although they would tell you that they've been at it a long time. But Maureen and I wanted somebody special for our 10th, and we thought, why not our young, talented partners? And so if you learn anything from this talk today, I hope that you will learn that verbal communication can lead to friendship, friendship can lead to mentorship, mentorship can lead to partnership and hopefully great success. So guys, throw the ball to you, take her away. Thanks, Gord. 
No, put away the BlackBerry. Actually, you don't need to worry. It never works anyway. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks everyone for uh, for coming today, and uh, thank you to Gordon Marine for hosting and uh, hosting this uh, speaker series. It's a it's an honor and a privilege privilege for Evan and I to be here today to tell our story, share our story, uh, share some lessons learned, and uh, hopefully you walk away with something. It's it's always fun to be in these sort of settings because it wasn't long ago that Evan and I were in these very seats either watching a speaker series or actually taking classes. So it's, uh, it's pretty exciting for us to be here and to share our stories. And it's, uh, it's a lot of fun that we get to have. We're going to take you through our adventures and how we went from this, which, which is actually a photo of our original shop and office, uh, <laughs> and how we went to this, the next shop and office, and how we finally got to this, our current shop and office that we're in. We want to share our story of all the times we've been stuck, <laughs> <laughs> the tough times, <laughs> the odd good time. Yeah. You know, <laughs> generally, they're all good times, just really tough lessons. So <laughs> let's start uh, back a few years when it all got started. So I was a business student at the Edwards School of Business <laughs> studying accounting, and I, uh, I don't check my transcript. I'm about the worst accountant that you can ever, ever meet. Um, so, I, But I got through it. I, I didn't want to be an accountant. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. But the problem was I didn't have a business idea, which is pretty important if you want to be an entrepreneur. <laughs> there was something going on called the Idea Challenge. The Wilson Center is, uh, was hosting a new business plan competition, an idea competition. And so I volunteered to help promote the, uh, promote the event. And the then director, Sanj, said, Brian, I'll send you to the, uh, to the Commerce Main Landing here, and you can help promote it to all your friends and, and get the competition going. And I said, no, Sanj, send me over to engineering. And he looked at me a little funny, thought maybe I was, I was going to go pick up some engineering girls. And there's, there's, <laughs> there's not many girls in engineering. So I said, I'm going to, I'm going to find a new partner. And, uh, and he looked at me and said, OK, whatever. You can go work in engineering. And so I, I show up to the engineering uh, booth. And um, there's this tall, <laughs> this tall farm boy. The guy gets up and soft-spoken guy he says, hey, my, name, my name's Evan. And I say, hey, I'm Brian. And I said, do you have a business idea? Just right into it. And he says, yeah, I do. And I said, well, what is it? <laughs> and he says, I'm not telling, thinking, <laughs> th thinking this greasy commerce kid's going to just steal his idea. And so I do, I do whatever, what every commerce kid is taught to do. I give him my business card, and I say, call me. <laughs> A week goes by, no call. Second week goes by, no call. A an engineering student that was actually standing up, a commerce student, not very common. <laughs> So I do what every, everyone does these days, and then, sorry, Gord, I go on a Facebook, and I find him on Facebook, Facebook stock, and I send him a message. I said, Evan, if you want to win this business plan, you need a commerce kid involved to help you with your marketing plan, your finance plan. And I think by then he realized this was going to be a lot of work, and so he agreed to meet. And uh, we met at the geo in geology uh, at, the, uh, at, uh, uh, at, the di at the dinosaurs there, and I remember going there, and I... I, I go see, uh, see Evan, and, and I'm like, so what's your big idea? Expecting something really high-tech and a new <laughs> innovation. And he says, oh, I got this idea to turn containers into housing. And I look at him and say, well, it wasn't really what I was expecting, but that's a heck of a lot better than the idea I have, because I didn't have one. Uh, and, and he said, containers are durable. There's lots of them, and we can turn them into something. And I said, great. So we decided to team up and uh, enter this uh, idea challenge. We worked on our business plan, we did all of our financial pro formas, we did lots of brainstorming on marketing ideas, lots of meeting, and we asked for, asked for advice and mentorship, and, and we, submitted, we submitted our business plan. And apparently it wasn't that good, because they were narrowing the 50 or 60 applications or submissions down to, down to only 10 people. And uh, we, there, there was a, a big announcement, and we showed up to it, and it, the news broke that there was actually going to be an 11, 11th, uh, um, I guess, contestant that would uh, be moving forward. And we found out later that we were the 11th that, uh, that got through. <laughs> so we had some work to do and some improvements to make, but we took the next couple of weeks to make them. And uh, we ended up making uh, our pitch on stage, a bit of a Dragon's Den type of uh, um, an event. And we ended up actually taking, going from 11th place to first place. And we won the first ever idea challenge here at the, at the university. So we had $30,000, which is 
we thought a really lot, of, you know, quite a bit of money. So we said, well, what can we do with the money? Because you didn't have to spend on the business. You know, finish paying for school, buy a ring, go to Vegas. <laughs> and I think we made the right decision because we took that $30,000 and we put it into our business. Yes, yeah, so we took the money and we, we built a prototype. So we had never done this before. A um, couple challenges. I think I framed it three different times and plumbed it twice. But eventually we got it right. And uh, it turned out to, to work out really well. It's, it turned out very durable, and we knew that we could build buildings out of containers after building that first one. Um, everyone loved it. Uh, we ended up actually bringing it to the Wilson Center pitch party. Uh, the only issue is uh, nobody wanted one. <laughs> <laughs> so we had a problem. We had no sales. We had spent our $30,000 on building our prototype, so we were sort of out of ideas, and then... Well, we did what we thought any, any good uh, entrepreneurs would do, and, you know, let's go to the Dragon's Den. So we audition here, and when we, we go through our audition, the uh, producer said, well, you can, we want you to come on the den, but we want you to bring a unit. And uh, so we said, great, well, we just built this beautiful prototype. We'll bring that. And uh, they say, well, that won't fit in our studio, so you have to build a, build a new unit. And we said, well, that's too bad because we don't have any money. Um, <laughs> and so... Uh, fortunately, the, the, the then Dean, Grant Isaac, became a bit of a mentor and was then the newly minted CFO at Cameco. Uh, so we uh, put, to, put together a sponsorship request and submitted it to Cameco and said, would you give us $5,000 uh, to help us build this prototype and we'll put your logo on it. And we're driving across Canada. It's going to be on, on national TV. And, and Grant signed off on it and gave us some, some money to build this prototype that you see here that uh, we then ended up driving to, uh, to Toronto. So we almost ran out of gas a few times on the way. <laughs> uh, we practiced lots at the various uh, restaurants uh, along the way. And finally, these three cowboys from Saskatchewan with this one-ton diesel truck and a 30-foot flat deck uh, pull into downtown Toronto, which was a hilarious sight, I'm sure. And we have to pull into uh, a bit of a side story, but we had to find parking in downtown Toronto with basically, you know, 50 feet of vehicle and trailer, which is a bit of a challenge. That's another story. Anyway, the next day, we, uh, we back into the, to the freight elevator at CBC blocking uh, traffic at uh, Front and Young, downtown Toronto on a Monday morning rush hour. <laughs> we get it in the freight elevator, we push it up, and we make our big pitch. It, we were in the den for about 30 minutes, and they ended up cutting it down to, down to about 10 minutes, I think. Uh, show of hands, who has seen the pitch? Mostly Lear. Okay, so it's no surprise. Most people know by now that Brett Wilson invite, uh, invested in the company um, on the show, and we closed the deal uh, a little bit thereafter. And so... The heat was really on now. We had money from this billionaire investor, Brett Wilson. We were still these young, uh, sort of <laughs> ignorant uh, new grads uh, who didn't really know what they were going to do. We still had really had no sales, but we had money. And so we got a little bit lucky. Uh, I had gone to a, uh, a bit of a networking event um, uh, where junior mining companies were trying to raise money. And I said, well, I'll go there. I don't have any money to give them, but I've got my brochures to give them and, and show them that we build camps and whatnot. And so I, I ended up giving a brochure to uh, uh, Mark, Lepe Le Mark LePage, who uh, is also a graduate uh, and was a colleague or a classmate. Give him our pamphlet uh, as he's working the Claude Resources booth. And he gives it to his boss, he, and then his boss's boss gives it to his boss, and it makes its way eventually to the general manager of a gold mine, Paul Cranford. He's the cartoon. Um, <laughs> Paul calls us one day and says, hey, Brian, I hear you guys build mining camps. And we said, absolutely we do, and we never had. <laughs> and he says, well, I'd like to meet and, and, uh, and figure this out, and so can I come by your office? And I said, absolutely, and we didn't have an office. <laughs> <laughs> But we had a container prototype we built, so we said, come on down to our container <coughs> office. And, and, he, and he came down and he says, uh, so here's what I'm thinking. And thank goodness we had a whiteboard there. He gets out a, a marker, starts drawing what he wants. And, and thank goodness, because we had no idea what a mining camp actually looked like. <laughs> and he said, can you build this? And we said, yeah, for sure. He said, Kate, send me a quote. So Evan downloads Google SketchUp and starts designing this 22-person camp. And I start, I open up Excel uh, and start quoting out this camp. We had no idea what we were doing. Uh, we submit our bid to Claude Resources. A week goes by, no call. Second week goes by, no call. And all of a sudden, we get a phone call from Claude Resources saying, hey, we've got a, a purchase order for $526,000 we'd like to send you. <laughs> what? <laughs> so we get our first big order for over a half a million dollars. And then we had a few other challenges we had to figure out, like how to build it. 
Yeah, so we got the PO, so now we had to quit our jobs and figure out how we were going to build this uh, before the ice roads melted. Um, this, this camp ended up having 22 rooms, full dining room, full kitchen, laundry room. Um, it, it was a pretty big job, but we actually got it done on time and on budget, and they liked it so much that we ended up building a whole other one that season. So there was a few 2 a.m. mornings uh, on that one. Um, and then the next year, they liked it so much that we built second stories for them. So it, uh, it was a fun project. It really got us going. Um, but we found out that uh, we didn't make any money because camps need fire alarms and fresh air and things like that. So we didn't quote that in originally. <laughs> so we eventually, we thought we had liftoff though. Like we had a lot of big jobs done. Um, we were feeling pretty good. Uh, but we also grew our business. So we had a lot more overhead. And uh, that kind of leads me into talking about some of our growing pains that we, that we had at this time. This is a classic picture. This probably happened once, uh, <laughs> once a day, me giving Brian the news. Oh, I forgot this, or yeah. So um, what, we what we always had issues with is sales and production. We would always get, put our heads down, get a, get a quote out, and then we'd have to build this thing. So then we'd start building it. Meanwhile, not quoting or working on anything. We're just building this thing. Okay, we're done that project. Now what are we doing? Oh yeah, I guess we got to go quote and, and make sure we have sales. So we'd have this, uh, you know, hurry up and quote, hurry up and build, and then the shop would be sitting there for, for uh, months at a time because we hadn't kind of planned ahead. So we were only really looking weeks in advance a lot of times. So that was one of our biggest issues that we had. And, and to be clear, it was an issue because Evan was doing most of the work himself and I was the flooring <laughs> guy. So it's not that we were sitting idle yeah. waiting for something. It's that yeah. we were not just selling it, quoting it. We were... Yeah, Brian was putting the flooring <laughs> in. And <laughs> yeah, building it. Framing. So, uh, yeah. so that, that created some challenges. So we needed to figure out how to get past these challenges and, uh, and a way to smoothen out our production line. Uh, one, of the, one of the opportunities that we identified um, early on was that Companies like that, uh, mining companies, oil and gas companies tend to want to rent instead of always buy. They want to write off the expense of, a, of an operating expense instead of capitalizing an asset. And so we knew there was this rental opportunity. And at the same time, one of the judges for the idea challenge, uh, who actually apparently got us into the top 11, um, <laughs> just had, had sort of been kicking around a little bit and, and uh, bugging us once in a while and sort of wanted to invest in us. But we told him to kind of go pound sand for a little while. We already had an <laughs> investor. That guy's name was actually Gord Haddock. <laughs> and, uh, and so eventually, uh, Gord, kind of in his persistent way, um, <laughs> said, you know what, boys, I think it might be time to start a rental company because this can help smoothen out your production problems. And uh, we can bu be building rental units when we are, you know, finished a big project. And uh, we said, well, you know, that's not too bad of an idea. So we started working on the business plan. And then one day my phone rings and it's a guy named Peter Groom from Fort McMurray. This new fee p uh, calls and says, hey, Brian, uh, I hear you, do you guys have uh, rental offices available? We said, absolutely. And we, <laughs> and we didn't. <laughs> uh, but we said, absolutely we do, Peter. And, uh, and he says, good, well, I need about 10 of them. And 10 of them, okay, uh, that sounds good. How soon do you need them, Peter? Uh, in about a week. <laughs> Uh-oh, that's the problem. So, of course. Evan, we, we, we've got to build some rental units. <laughs> Gord, uh, we need money. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I know we don't have a shareholders agreement yet, but we've got our handshake and we've got this one page business plan. So <laughs> let's get started. And, uh, and we did. And we built those 10 units for MMR and they ended up taking about 40 rental units over the next uh, year and a half as they were developing Curl Lake oil sands project. And our rental company today now owns uh, over 100 uh, offices and wash cars that we rent out across Canada. And it solved a, a huge headache that we had and it, it really kind of frankly saved our bacon in a few of our slow times that allowed us to keep building. So that was a, an important part and that sort of uh, helps you understand how that friendship uh, turns into mentorship and eventually it, it has turned into partnership and it uh, has really helped our business. So that's, uh, that was one big turning point for our business. Another big turning point, which I call the TSN turning point, was when we, we saw a public tender uh, on Mercs for uh, the design and supply of a military barracks for Four Wing Cold Lake in Alberta. And uh, we said, well, we can build. This is basically a mining camp, except it's for military. We can do this. 
And uh, so we g go through the tender, sort of like last time, you know, Evan, except now Evan's doing the quoting and the drawing. Um, and, uh, and we go through this and we, you know, it's a bit of an odd tender, government tenders. And so the last page of the whole project literally is this. This is the bid form, section 15, price schedule. They want to know how many bedrooms you could build for how much, how much money. And in their bid, they were quite clear that they wanted 180 bedrooms and their budget was $2.8 million. And we're not that smart, so we decided just to put 180 bedrooms we could build for $2.8 million. <laughs> Seemed pretty reasonable. Uh, we submit the bid. There's no floor plans, promotional material. They know nothing about who's bidding this, but some, there's two young guys in Saskatchewan that put they can do this. And so <laughs> a couple of weeks go by and, and uh, we get a fax message, which we're lucky we even got because it comes to our email. Uh, and it's, it uh, congratulated 320 Modular on the award of this $2.8 million <laughs> contract. Uh-oh. There's a few challenges with that, we realized. We got all the contract and there's a paperwork like this and we don't like paper, but we go through all the paperwork and we started realizing that there was a few, a few uh, uh, hooks with this job that we maybe should have identified earlier. Number one is that we had to, instead of getting money as a deposit and progress payments from the government, they wanted us to give them money as security, which sounded a little funny to us at the time. And they wanted not just like a little bit of money, they wanted $500,000 in cash uh, to show that we could actually do the job, uh, you know, equivalent to a performance bond. And of course we weren't bondable. And so we <laughs> said, well, we need to come up with $500,000. And then I said, well, what about working capital for the actual project? How are we gonna build it? And, uh, and uh, they, they weren't gonna give us money for progress. And so we said, okay, well, we gotta come up with kind of about $2 million to, to float this project. And so <laughs> uh, we, I got to work on a financing strategy uh, the other problem was that we realized that we had 59 days to actually build this project. That's Evan's problem. Yeah, so, <laughs> so we found out we got this PO, and then I had to think about, well, which one was that again? And then I realized which one it was, and then I realized how much time we had to build this thing. And so luckily it was a fairly vague requirement. Uh, they had basically that many rooms for that price. So originally we had sort of a layout where we had containers as the hallway, we realized, okay, we don't have time to do that many containers. There was 18 containers, so we were able to actually get rid of those and use the sides of the, con of the, the bedroom modules as hallways. So this cut out 18 different, or 18 containers, about $180,000 worth of stuff, just by kind of making that quick switch. And then we were able to go three stories because we used containers, so uh, by doing that, we saved on roofing and piles and things like that. Um, so yeah, it was, it was a very demanding project. It didn't really go as planned in some ways either. It, uh, the weather wasn't cooperating and a few different things. I, I think I personally craned every one of those modules and climbed on the roof of every single one to hook it up and unhook it in the middle of blizzards. I think I also got frostbite on my face. So we're not <laughs> going to show that picture, but you don't want to see it. But yeah, I, I <laughs> it, was, uh, it was quite the, quite the project, but it turned out to be a beautiful building and we're still very proud of that building. Um, it's, it's still something we like to show off and, and uh, they're still happy with it. So it seems to be working out well for them. It's definitely different than anything else we've ever done or what they've ever had. So it, it, it was a good project. This was an absolute game changer for our company. We had done $2.8 million of work in about 59 days. Um, so this, this was really exciting for us. And it was really high profile. So these two young guys here, we were on cloud nine. We thought we had absolutely made it. If we didn't have liftoff before, we had it now. This was, this was the beginning of real success. And, and I guess maybe we got something called golden boy syndrome because uh, we maybe got a little bit, um, I don't know if cocky is the right word, but uh, we, we certainly were pretty ignorant. And uh, because this, we had this big project, we also started accumulating more and more overhead. That's a real number, uh, $119,000 a month of overhead post um, this mega project. That's a lot of overhead. Uh, between payroll, we had ramped up to 30,000 or 40,000 square feet of building um, and, and hired too many people. And, and I mean, we were scaled up for this big project and we kept everybody on because we had about $2 million of work in the pipeline or so we thought. Unfortunately, we were terribly wrong about that. We ended up only having about $250,000 of work in the pipeline, which created a very big issue for us. 
Yeah, so, uh, you know, don't count your chicks before they hatch kind of a, kind of a situation. We, I remember getting phone calls uh, saying, yep, we're going to go ahead, PO in the mail next week, start buying material. PO never came. So we, we kept our fire stoked. We kept our business big for, for longer than we should have. And then customers would come in just when we were about to, okay, let's start, you know, fixing this problem. Hey, we need a $3 million camp up in Northwest Territories. Okay, sure, let's go on a tour and do a bunch of uh, work on it. And then PO never came. So we, we wanted to stay big so that we could tackle those kind of jobs. But eventually we realized, no, we have to tighten the belt. We have to do it right away, hard and fast. So, so we, we really found where we could save. And, and we've carried that lesson forward even, even today. And I don't think we'll ever forget it because it was quite painful. It was very painful. There, there, were, uh, there were days, weeks, and months that we weren't sure what was going to be next and if we were even going to be here next month. So um, we had some tough times uh, after being so high on that cloud. And like Evan said, we tightened our belt, um, but we knew that wouldn't be enough. If we wanted to stay in business, grow our business, and, and come back from this, we need to do something else. And it was, it was more than just saving money. It was about innovating. And the next story that uh, um, really changed sort of our business was related to an innovation um, of taking, uh, uh, of basically redesigning a container. Um, one of the constant kind of feedback of, that we'd get from customers was that containers are too narrow. They're eight feet wide. If we want site meetings, that's, that's just too small. So people love the durability, the stackability, the transportability of the container, but um, the width just wasn't what it needed to be in our competition all had 10 feet wide and 12 feet wide trailers. And so um, Evan and I sat down one day and said, we have to figure out how to fix this. And of course, it doesn't take long for Evan to come up with an idea and, uh, and, and invent. And he comes into my office, I don't know how many times a week, saying, Brian, I've got an idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, this one was a really good one, and it really saved us. So this is uh, a 12 wide uh, container in the, in the process. Uh, Evan found a way to basically stretch out containers and it has totally changed uh, what we provide for our industrial clients. Um, office space, we actually started uh, widening to, uh, to uh, 16 wide, uh, but we can still stack it. They're still as rugged, just as durable and engineered the same way an eight wide is. Uh, we've been able to create larger spaces for remote, uh, this is a passenger lounge in Northern Saskatchewan. Um, we've built sales centers in Saskatoon, and just because they're wider doesn't mean they can't still be shipped. And, uh, and so we still, we, that 12 wide invention totally rejuvenated <coughs> our business and allowed us to um, have sort of renewed growth and uh, really reestablished our business in oh. the marketplace. So with this new innovation, our, our customer list grew. We were building custom solutions for a lot of different companies. Uh, they'd come to us and we'd, uh, we'd work with them and, and being able to stretch means that we could do anything. So. Uh, that was a, a key innovation. But what happened was that all those businesses were oil, gas, mining, construction, all commodity-based type stuff. So we needed to, to look at uh, something else for that. So this, fortunately, we, we have gotten smarter over the years. Gord might disagree. <laughs> but uh, we, we, uh, this time we, we sort of knew something was needed to change before we were looking at the bank account and saying, okay, something <laughs> absolutely has to change. Um, so when oil started hitting, coming down to $40 a barrel, capital expansions were diminishing uh, in potash and, and uranium uh, companies, and the general economic outlook started, started looking negative. And we said, well, there has to be other opportunities out there. And we've been so focused on our container-based products for those markets that um, it was time to sort of look around. We received believe it or not, another public tender that uh, it turned out to change our life. So we got a, there was a public tender on SAS tenders for the design and supply of portable classrooms for the Regina Catholic School Division. And we never built a classroom before, but that's never stopped us before. And uh, Evan and I look at each other and say, yeah, I think we could probably build some school portable classrooms. So Evan starts going through their design requirements and, and again invents another way of building, this time not with a container. So it was the first time we were deviating from the original business to build with out of the, out of the container, the thing that made us different. And we diversified uh, and we submitted a bid uh, to the Regina Catholic School Division and another week goes by, no call. And then all of a sudden we get a phone call from the division saying, we're interested in, in talking to you guys more about this. We'd like to make a few changes to the design and to the price. And, uh, and we work through those things and they say, well, we've got budget for nine portables. 
we don't trust you enough to build all nine of them, uh, but we're going to give you the contract for three of them. And we said, hey, that's great. Uh, this is a start. This is a chance for us to prove ourselves and, and, uh, and sort of develop a new product because we have not actually fully designed and built one yet. So um, it was time. And uh, we created uh, um, three school portable classrooms, and it was an absolute success. Um, yeah, they're, they're still just like containers in a lot of ways. They're still transportable. They're still craneable. Um, but there's a lot more benefits with going to a, a, a scratch-built building is we can build them a lot longer, wider, taller. Uh, we can change the exteriors so they can match existing buildings and, and look a lot better. The interiors can look amazing. We can have 10-foot ceilings um, and then the HVAC systems and all the, the mechanical systems. It's a lot easier to build n not a container. Containers are pretty restrictive. So this really opened up um, a lot even more customer base and a lot more projects that we could work on. Um, and then that brought us to a cool opportunity we had this year where um, Bob and Tom uh, Bissonette came to us and said, hey, can you guys build a cabin? I'm like, yeah, yeah, we can build a cabin. We, uh, <laughs> we've been wanting to do residential for years and, uh, and it was finally the right time and Brian and I had kind of figured out what's our style, what do we want to do, we don't want to be like any builder, we want to make it look really slick. So we, we really chose like a Scandinavian minimalist design which actually is easier to build too because we're always obsessed with efficiency. So going to the minimal, minimalist design really helped that. But um, it was an awesome opportunity. Unfortunately, we only gave ourselves a month to build it because we put it into a sports and leisure show. Uh, we had lots of time to do it, but we kind of procrastinated on some other projects. Um, but we got it done, so I, I can't wait to see what we can do with two months. I, I think we can really build something <laughs> <laughs> incredible. Yeah, so th that's, that's kind of where we're hoping to head a little bit more, a new, a new arm for our business. Yeah, so as you can tell, we've, we've been through a, a few ups, many downs, and... Uh, and we are proud, though, of where we are today. And uh, a quick update for some of you who are wondering, um, where are we today? Uh, we are now Saskatchewan's largest modular industrial manufacturer. In fact, we're now Saskatchewan's largest manufacturer of school portable classrooms, which we are very proud of. Yay. We've designed and built, uh, with great partners, a new facility in BizHub and, and Industrial. Uh, so we've now got a place that we're proud to call home and, uh, and have a, an ownership in. Um, we own over 100 office trailers and wash cars that we rent across Canada. We've got product as far west as BC, as far east as Ontario, as far north as Alaska, and as far south as Wisconsin. We've, got, uh, we've produced over 400, I think it's closer to 500 modular buildings now. We've got a more diversified product line uh, than we've ever had before. And this is what we're, we're really proud of this. Last year, we had our best year ever, and we actually had 45% growth in our top line and even better growth in our bottom line. And we did this in a downward economy, which is, I think everyone can attest to, a very tough thing to do. So we're very proud of it. We have a, a wonderful team that's, uh, that's allowed us to do that. And, and with Evan's uh, constant innovation and new ideas, it's allowed us to diversify to uh, so many new markets. And, uh, and, uh, and enabled us and set us up for success this year and, and into years past and, or into years future. And, and this year's going to be even a better year and our bankers here. So um, I want you to know that that 45% that growth is going to be, we're going to see that again, Dwayne. So, um, so if you didn't listen to Gord's original pitch about putting down the phones and if you've been on Twitter for the last, last 28 minutes, uh, now's the time to put it down. Um, we've got sort of five key lessons that we would like you to walk away with if you haven't heard any of this before. Number one, pick your people very carefully. This goes for partners, this goes for employees, and, and frankly also spouses. Um, <laughs> uh, it, uh, and questions may come up, uh, but you know there were three of us on the Dragon's End in some of those earlier photos, and there's only two of us here today. Uh, I don't know if Goldstein is still, still teaching business law, but he always said the partnership is a dangerous ship to sail, and he's absolutely correct. Pick your partners very wisely. And team, uh, we, it, we sort of learned the hard way that uh, you're only as good as your staff, and uh, hiring and surrounding yourselves with great, uh, great people uh, and leadership within your organization is, is absolutely there's a, it's absolutely paramount to success. Number two, network. Show up. All you students here that showed up today, you are 
far for, you're way ahead than, uh, than your colleagues just by showing up and being here and coming out and talking to other business people that are here. Um, networking is the most cost-effective marketing tool that you will have. Uh, I spend probably, I don't know, 25% of actually my, my work life networking and being out there. And, and uh, it has brought us significant business opportunities. It's uh, forged strong supplier relationships with people like Jim and uh, j and &E Welding. Um, and, uh, and it's just been such a core part of our business. And, and Gord's right, you never know who you're sitting next to on the airplane, so say hello, because in our case, uh, you know, introducing ourselves to Gordon Marine at an event have, has turned into some significant uh, partnership uh, years later and has, uh, has really changed our lives and our business. Number three, and this is a bit tricky, and, and you may find it a bit odd, but find a way to focus and diversify at the same time. One of the biggest pieces of advice is we got uh, when we went through business plan competitions and not the idea challenge uh, didn't give us this piece but there was one in particular that said focus 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 you can't get distracted by the butterflies you got to focus and this ended up being one of our biggest issues we, we focused so hard on our container based product line for certain markets that we never looked beyond those opportunities and uh, and so it wasn't until we found a way to focus and diversify that really I think has led to some of our success our competitive advantage isn't about necessarily our product. Yeah, we build a better product, it's a nicer product, it's priced better, it's all of those things. But really what makes us different is that we do what others don't, won't, or can't. And this is what, this is what will make a difference in your relationships, in your partnerships, and in business. Uh, we do things that ACWA won't do, we do things that a general contractor won't do. If we get a customer that calls us with a problem, we want to come up with a solution with a modular building. And that is really is what, uh, what has made us successful. Number five, this is the most important point. Entrepreneurship is not a get-rich-quick scheme. <laughs> it is not a get-rich-quick scheme. We, can, we are very good personal examples of that. There have been a, <laughs> there's been a lot of long hours, and, and it's been a lot of hard work, and, and we're getting there. What did you calculate our hourly wage the one in year? <laughs> in our first year, we were making, I think, Five dollars an hour. Yeah, that's good. That's Both good. That that's based good money. On, on the the time we worked, and I think it's gotten a little better. I hope. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, we we have a saying, and and that you know, there's two decision criteria when we're making an investment or a business decision: is number one, will it make money, and number two, is it fun? If it'll make money but it's not fun, we won't do it. If it doesn't make money but it's fun, we shouldn't do it. <laughs> if it's going to make money and be fun, that's that's the, that's, the, that's the winning equation. Uh, it's all about fun for us. We wouldn't be doing the work we, we were doing if it, if it wasn't as fun a, as, it, uh, as it has been. And it's fun because of the people involved. Evan and I have a wonderful partnership. Um, we've got wonderful partners, Gordon Marine, and wonderful partner, obviously, in Brett and, and, uh, and others yet. And we've got a wonderful staff that makes it so enjoyable. So those are the five things that you need to remember, remember students, if you haven't paid attention at all. Now we'd like to open the floor to any questions, comments, anything we didn't address that you'd like to hear about. And actually, we have a catch box for questions, right? Yes. So how does this work? Does anyone know how this works? <laughs> There's a switch on the bottom. Just throw, Just throw it. So if you've got a question, raise your hand. Underhand. Underhand? Oh, not, okay. not a fastball? <laughs> <laughs> not a fast pitch? <laughs> I'm ready. So questions, you get the catch box, and it, there's actually a mic in here. Uh, wow. So you will be heard by <laughs> everyone else. So, What is this thing? I'm just going to throw it. <laughs> Do I do anything to it? Oh, there you go. Well, well done. You're live. Um, what a random throw that was, Brian. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, you answered many questions that I had during your presentation. Great presentation, by the way. I wanted to ask if Brett was still involved as an active part or a silent partner, I guess, and it sounds like he is. That's he the is. case. Yeah. Um, and, and the other question that I had for you was around, and you talked about this, I think, in your $5 an hour um, um, <laughs> formula. Um, can you maybe give some advice for the students in the audience that uh, maybe have um, some design or expectation in terms of what um, their starting wages may be in, in the work environment and, and uh, what the reality <laughs> may be in relation to that? <laughs> That's a, uh, uh, do you want me to talk to your kid? <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> I've got two. Well, well actually, I, I want to back up. There's, 
I think, a real big issue that we need to address. And number one, it's that everyone gets, you know, goes into post-secondary and has this expectation that you're going to get your certificate or your degree and there's just going to be a job for you. Where are these jobs coming <laughs> from? They, they don't just, just don't appear somewhere. So, you know, entrepreneurs like us and hopefully some of you are in charge of creating those jobs. Um, salary expectations for, for new hires, I, I don't know what the data is, but I'll tell you, I'll maybe phrase it this way. We, we learned that you get what you pay for. Um, so you should, you should not, uh, by any means, underpay um, your people, uh, not even entry level in our opinion. I, I, uh, we have built a great team because we now pay better than we did five years ago. Um, and, uh, and I think that, that there's expectations that probably don't meet reality and, and you should, it's, it shouldn't be about, especially for your first five years of work, you shouldn't be worried about how much you're going to make. It should be all about the experience you're going to get and the people you're going to meet. Yeah, make sure you're doing something that you love and the money comes later. So that, that's kind of what um, we've been told and what we've found and, and just what we've seen. We, we, it hasn't come yet. <laughs> Close. It hasn't come yet. But um, yeah, we, we find like when we hire people, if they're passionate and maybe they start out at a certain amount, but they're eager, eager to learn and they, and they, they care. It, it's all about that caring. Um, people can be taught anything we find, but it's, it's all about attitude. If you have the right attitude and you stick it out, a good boss will realize that, I hope, and, and make adjustments for you. But it doesn't happen in, th in three months. It, it's a, like a four-year process. So. Oh, you need, you need the box. Oh, yeah, right. No, no talking. Um, can you guys talk about how... In the beginning, though, for you guys, like, because you had multiple, like, you had your own job and then you had your business, you kind of just went over that lightly in your. Oh yeah. So, like, to the talk about days. salary expectation, but in that. <laughs> okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Zero. Would love to hear about just that. for full disclosure, this is this yeah. is coming from a wife. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Go on. <laughs> they're. they're uh, so my, my daily routine uh, in the first year was go to my full-time job out of university. I worked for a year, and Brian worked for a year as well. Go to our jobs, go home, change into dirty work clothes, drive to Warman, work in construction basically until like 11, go home, a lot of McDonald's in, in between there, <laughs> and then do it all the next day. And then weekends? No, no, you, you're working. Like it's... For us, it was really like the only reason we're where where we are now is just head down work ethic. It's not like we have a an amazing like our product's good, but like it it, it comes down to work. <laughs> like it, it really came down to Brian and I working well together and just working. And when you think you should stop working, you should work some more. Usually, it's kind of how <laughs> it, it, for longer. So it's just starting to turn a point for us right now. And if we would have given up a year ago, like where would we be? So it's it's. It's just kind of persistence, and you kind of have to be a cockroach. Yeah, yeah, you do. I, 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 I yeah, <laughs> just get stomped on and keep going. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. Well, e Evan's a really big cockroach. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it'll take a lot uh, of stomping. I, I, I remember uh, we were doing a job for Cameco, and w again, we... We didn't quit our jobs until we got that cool resources project. And we had done like small $20,000 jobs sort of uh, to sort of earn our stripes and get in the door. And we were doing a job for Cameco and we were there until about 2 a.m. And I remember, you know, my wife's also here, Carmen, and she said, uh, I said, uh, I mean, it's going to be a late night. She's like, Brian, I don't care how much you work as long as you come home <laughs> and sleep in our bed. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw so at 2 a.m. I driving from Warman back to our house and and uh, up at five and driving back uh, to be there. And I really just wanted to sleep at the shop that <laughs> night. <laughs> but uh, th there's, there's been some really tough, tough times. And, and you know, now it's uh, with the team we have, we don't have the same tough times. There's still the odd push where there's some late nights and whatnot. But, uh, you know, the first year, two, three, yeah, <laughs> there, there, there were some, there were some big. And I mean, on that note, when we were a little bit smaller, you know, putting in a few extra nights and one extra person, it made a big difference in the schedule. But now, the size we are, um, one person working three extra hours hardly is noticeable. So we're better off focusing on how can we make things more efficient, and do we need to hire like five more people, and do we need to work every weekend? So it's it's kind of bigger scope things, but. Back when we were small, it made a huge difference that we did put in those hours and 
and and uh, yeah, so it's uh, that's kind of where where that's at. Okay, Alexis. Oh, you, you gotta know, toss good the. Your throw is. Toss the <laughs> <laughs> Do I have to hit it? Yeah. Or can, can you hear me? Okay. Uh, can you guys talk about your relationship as partners? Looks like we got like the token engineer, tall guy, <laughs> just very quiet, shy, and then we got like the real outgoing salesy guy. Is that is that correct? We, we we're. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you answered it. We 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 and actually, it's funny. We were talking about this today that we're. We we're probably look more of a typecast than we are. Um, you know, I sort of look after sales and finance, and Evan looks after design and engineering and operations. But there is far more overlap, um, and uh, it's sort of converged over the last couple of years more. But Evan is is um, absolutely imperative in our sales process. Like I, I would say, I do the business development side, but as soon as we've got a really good lead, it's over to Evan, and Evan's dealing with the customer. And there's nobody else the customer would actually rather talk to than the guy that knows what he's talking about uh, and, and actually will design and work with them uh, on the project because most of our customers are other engineers and stuff so Evan's, Evan's actually probably our, our main sales guy even though he doesn't seem like he would ever wear that hat. And on that note um, Brian is uh, always designing stuff. Uh, he's, I'm always bouncing ideas off him. You wouldn't know it but the guy actually knows uh, quite a bit. <laughs> Uh, and, and he's practical. He's in some ways because he, he doesn't overthink some things. I'll throw some ideas, and he's just like, I like the the first one sounds the, like the most doable. Let's maybe that one sounds like. Why don't you look at that? So he kind of helps me uh, stay focused sometimes. So it's it's yeah. There's a lot more than just business engineering. There's a lot more mashing up for we, sure. We've we've got a pretty cool relationship. I don't think there's many partners that can. I don't think we've ever really fought or yelled. No. It's no. it's it's like we always say. It's like you know he's we're work wives and then we go home to our other wives and, <laughs> and it's, it, it's just you know it's just it, it's it's just the way it is. One of the one of the, th the misconceptions as well. I mean that's why Evan's up here. If any of you have heard the three twenty story before, it's probably just out of my mouth. Um, but Evan Evan is uh, is is a part. Uh, I mean he's the big part of the story and and I love when he can get up here and also share his insight because. It's sort of the untold story, the the stuff that that the that the salesy guy doesn't always tell you. It's it's the other <laughs> stuff. So, so uh, we have uh, an awesome partnership. It, we also kind of uh, come from similar backgrounds, and and I think we have similar work ethics too. So that that's a big part of it too. We yeah. we both grew up with not not extremely privileged, I guess you could say. So pretty poor. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> one. So we're we're both uh, we're both you know very similar uh, upbringing as well. So we're I guess our our cores are the same. Oh, we got to make it. get a coffee there, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Woo. Good catch. Uh, my name is Nelson. Thank you guys for your amazing presentation. Very inspiring and informative. Uh, I just wanted to backtrack to, to when you guys started with the ideation uh, competition. Uh, I know you, you didn't have an idea to begin with, and Evan had the, the, the modular idea. I wanted, I wanted to ask, how do you, how do you approach problem solving or, or coming up with something to, to kind of build a business on? Like, where do you guys find that, that? Where do you guys decide that this is a good idea that we should pursue? When I, I guess when I have a problem on an engineering side, um, maybe not so much a new business idea. This is going to sound funny, but uh, I kind of base it around um, I, I'm, I'm lazy. I want to do as much or as little as possible to get an end product. So when I'm designing a building, I'm thinking, okay, what's the least amount of movements I can make? What's the least amount of uh, cost and material and how can I build this the fastest? So it's kind of based, lazy is the wrong word. It's more of efficiency. <laughs> <laughs> Extremely ex trying to be efficient, obsessed with it. So I mean, I think in this world, you need to if you can find a business that you think will make some, anything more efficient, you've, I think you've got to pursue that. Uh, that's kind of my big thing is you can't go wrong making something more efficient than something else, whether it's a way to make donuts or whatever. It's, it, it could be anything. That's kind of how I approach problem solving is efficiency. But Gord, you wanted to pipe in here. Yeah. I, <laughs> I can tell. Uh, now the real story. <laughs> The one thing that Maureen and I have noticed, and we've had 16 different businesses 
we currently have four now, is you don't have to find the next computer app design. You can take the simplest idea. Everybody looks for this grand, man, I'm going to invent the new rocket ship. You don't have to. You might invent the golf cart that takes the astronauts. But if you're the best at that, you're successful. So don't, you can take a garage uh, and run the best garage. Do things different than anybody else. My uncle used to run one, and, and he painted the floor in the garage every 30 days. His washrooms, you could run your tongue along the floor. <laughs> every woman in town knew if you, had, you were out, you wanted to go to the washroom, they would go to that grass. <laughs> that washroom was spotless. The guys liked it because they went in the shop. There wasn't grease all over the floor and somebody's getting in their new truck. So it wasn't earth shaking. He had a, a business, but he just did it the best and separated himself from everybody else. So don't look for magic. Magic's all around you. Just find something. Find what people aren't doing well and just take over, and you'll own it, you'll, honestly. You'll be the best in town. Everybody will go to your place. No, well, that's good. My answer was 0.4 of my top five, so uh, reread that. It's do what others won't, don't, and can't. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, we got a long pass. I'm surprised I caught it. Uh, perhaps this is a little hush hush, but are there any markets you would be interested in into expanding into next? I think that the foray into the cabin market is a pretty strong signal that we're going to be looking at residential more. Um, okay. So that's that's the next thing on our list, and we'll do it differently than everyone else. Okay, awesome. Thank you. No, you need the box. <laughs> Oh, no, so, no, no, no. That is pretty far. <laughs> Thank you. I'd do the same thing. <laughs> Looks expensive. That's a good idea. <laughs> Thanks so much. And I just want to say it's been really exciting to watch your journey and, and to, to, to cheer you on um, and to cheer for some Saskatchewan boys. So uh, my question is, I was hoping that you would talk more, a little bit more about your background and what fuels the, the drive and your hard work and how do you, now that you're having some success, how do you keep that going? What's your current... Uh, to keep up because it's still really hard work and um, and I know that how hard you work to get the product ready for the sports and leisure show and it was uh, just an aside that I think it was the 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 thing of the show so it was exciting to see that at the show thanks what what keeps us driven on a personal level yeah, hard work. well <laughs> I think we're we're just work like we're just workers like I think we both had high school jobs we just we just worked um, and I think I, th I think we just sort of stumbled upon meeting each other and and started working for me what what keeps me motivated is knowing that um, we've got this awesome team and I want to keep them busy but I also want to motivate them by working myself too kind of pulling them along instead of pushing them along so that's kind of what keeps me motivated every day I would say is knowing that oh everyone else is showing up today I got to show up and and be their leader so and, and Brian too it needs to be the leader so it's uh, I think that right now that's what does it and I don't know what like what first started it I I think um, that both of us have always just wanted to build something it's 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 about not that not having that idea that you're just going to graduate and just and get a job um, which is fine but we I think we wanted to create jobs instead of get jobs and uh, that was just, it was an exciting opportunity that we had to, um, to, to start and grow. And, and uh, Evan is also, like, he's a, you're just a constant inventor. 
Like you know, he uh, that like the the wheels never stop turning. No, that's true. It, I, must, I, drive, it must drive you nuts, Alexis. It, it's it's not. Yeah, it's a yeah, problem like sometimes. The, like there's always a better way. Um, Evan's the typical like why why do we do it that way? Why do we do it that way? Um, and we're pretty lucky that we have jobs where we can just kind of spitball ideas, and then if one works, we'll just do it. Like we don't have to really answer to anybody. And if it's our own mistake, then we learn from it. So it's. We're, I guess that's, yeah, that's part of the fun, too, is just being able to make those decisions and going for it. Jim, you can almost just reach that box. <laughs> yeah. Well, I absolutely admire what you guys have been able to accomplish in a relatively short time, considering I've been at it for almost 37 years. <laughs> but but uh, my question for you, and it certainly was a question of mine uh, in the early going, is, I mean, you guys went to school with a lot of other capable, bright young folks, right? No question about it. Uh, when I was starting, um, I was amongst lots of other good tradespeople as well. One of the questions that I always ask myself, and I'm still not sure I got the answer, and I'm wondering if you guys might, is why are you entrepreneurial? Why, why do you do what you do? as opposed to uh, you look around the, your, your previous classmates or other people that you've worked with in that one year that you uh, had a job, and why is it you that is an entrepreneur and taking this on? What sets you apart from the others? And that's not an easy question. No, it's not. <laughs> I'm not, oh, Mar yeah. Mar Marla knows. <laughs> well, who? <Okay>, maybe, <laughs> maybe yeah, the outside uh, looking in can tell you. What, what, what's the answer, Marla? You're unemployable. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> this is the only <laughs> option. <laughs> yeah, this is all we okay, can do so right uh, now. Okay, so now I have the box. Okay, so I happen to be Brian's mother-in-law. <laughs> Um, I'm also a partner at Deloitte, and so when, when he was talking about how he took the accounting major, you know, probably I was one of the people behind him <laughs> pushing him into accounting. But really, you know, I want to just say I think a little bit what I've seen from Brian over the last several years, you know, obviously he's married to my daughter, I think a little bit of it is kind of genetic. Like, I think that, that Brian approaches risk maybe a little differently than some people. And I think that he approaches success and failure a little differently than some people. And the thing I've learned from Brian is that he's optimistic. And in fact, I think I've been known to say he's delusionally optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so I think in a loving way, he's delusionally <laughs> optimistic. So I guess what I would say, that. That's what I have seen in terms of kind of, you know, the folks that I've worked with in the accounting industry and, and others, you know, is he's incredibly optimistic. He's a positive thinker. It doesn't matter what it is, business, life, anything. Everything is successful to Brian because it's how you define success. And so when he does something, it always has a good outcome because he's the one that's, you know, defining and he's making choices. And so anyway, that's just my comment. And I don't know Evan quite as well, <laughs> but, you know, perhaps this is something that they share. We're both but delusional. <laughs> but but Brian, Brian was an entrepreneur when he was about eight years old. And so some of the stories I've heard of his, you know, his childhood, he started shoveling snow and then he figured out that if he got three other boys to shovel, he could make a profit margin by lining up jobs for them and, you know, things like this. So, so some of this is, is, you know, a little bit, I think a bit genetic and it's attitude and it's personality and anyway, so there you go. I'll <laughs> now here's the real story. <laughs> um, first of all, Deloitte's wouldn't hire Brian. His marks were so poor. That's true. <laughs> They As quoted nepotism, which was <laughs> BS. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the amazing thing is um, two things. Why, let's approach this from a different angle. Why did we invest money in these two guys? Why did we risk 40, 50, 40 some years of hard work in these two guys? With 
Brian, the first thing was he separated himself out because at every event he came and introduced himself to us. Then he introduced his girlfriend, who happens to be the mother of his children. <laughs> he stood out. No, nobody, I'll give you a, a, an example. We have been to the Wilson, sorry, the, the um, pitch party. Pitch party. And in 10 years, not one, other per not one person has come up to us and introduced and said, because we stand out, we're old, you know? <laughs> and uh, not other, no, nobody has come up to us in 10 years. And it's called the pitch party. That tells you something. He was always coming up and reinforcing who he was. That got my attention and Maureen's attention. Secondly, I go out at their Quonset where they're building this and, and we had developed a relationship and um, I've got an engineer outside, it's 30 below, the wind is howling and he's out pounding nails. Now, I don't know how many engineers just got their degree are outside pounding nails, but that told me everything I needed to know about Evan. And then they turned us down. <laughs> 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 Didn't need us. Which made you really walk really <laughs> pissed me off. But so that's the, the one key. And as far as entrepreneurism, <laughs> there is a lot of truth. It's like your mom. Your mom tells you what to do, and you don't want to do it. Your wife, wives ask you <laughs> why, why, well, these wives and you. <laughs> have a way of asking you to do it in a way that doesn't mean you have to do it, but you go do it. And moms never learn that <laughs> with sons, but wives and girlfriends, if they're the right ones, they lead you around like a bull with a ring in his nose. <laughs> <laughs> and that's, that's the difference, the, the attitudes and background and support and, and hard work and persistence. We have nothing more to add to that question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Didn't really answer oh, it, Jim. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank Thanks, you. Marla. Thanks, Marla. So I have a question. I work life balance. You were talking about coming home at two to stay in the bed for three hours till five. I remember Brett Wilson spoke and he said, if you want to be like a billionaire, do what I did. But if you actually want to have a life at home, don't follow anything I did. You clearly are doing well with your balancing act. Um, I'm married to an entrepreneur. I get to sleep with one. I'm very proud of that. I came from one, too, over there. So I'm very proud to be there. But um, how do you guys find your marriage to two beautiful ladies? And I love them very much. And they both have two beautiful kids each. So I mean, that's pretty, that's a lot of work for everybody involved. How do you balance? That because I think that when you're coming out of university, sometimes you're lucky enough to have already found your main life. Sometimes it doesn't happen until way later in your life, and sometimes it's not a focus at all. Clearly, you guys found these two quite early in your lives, and, and you knew what you had in them, and they knew what you they had in you. How do you foster that as you're trying to be successful in a business? How do you keep it successful? Because I think as society. You know, everybody has to balance their lives differently, and um, whether wives work or they stay at home, or vice versa, whoever owns the company, how do you keep this smoothly running so that this stays successful? Because your babies are small. Um, we run our lives differently. I know I came from this, and it was a well-oiled machine, so I looked for it when I got married, because I like the wild side of it, and I like that there's risk, and I like all of that, but I was raised in it. So they're clearly very supportive, but how are you going to make sure this stays? Because this, this garden's unattended. The whole business garden goes to ground. <laughs> Not to mention lawsuits that could follow. <laughs> 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 Remember, we did a lot of contracts that we have partners too. So, yeah. just wonder what you think well, about that. Well, I think pre-kids was a lot. There was a lot more working going on uh, post-kids. Yeah. Um, I met my wife a year after we kind of went full time. Um, so that year I was able to work nonstop basically. 
Um, but she basically saved me from that that <laughs> lifestyle. I I don't know where I'd be if it wasn't for her. To be honest, I'd be yeah, I'd be it'd be it'd be a problem. I think so. I think I was probably a full on workaholic at that point. But yeah. I met her and and she 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 gave me a reason to not work. So yeah. that was good. And then our beautiful children. Y- you want to be at home all the time. So it, it actually becomes pretty easy to just say, okay, I can wait till tomorrow. I'm going to go home and see my yeah. kids and, and my wife. So one but of the um, most important things that's allowed us to do that is by having the right team. So, you know, we don't need to be there all the time to make sure that a project actually gets done. Um, you know, don't get me wrong. I think we're still important there, uh, <laughs> but 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 we're less important than we were when we started the company. Um, you know, the other thing that that helps is that Ev and I are totally on the same page with this stuff. Is that families first? There's there's, I mean, we we're both at work early, but you know, there's not a day that really goes by that by three thirty. Uh, we're both pretty fast out the door to, to try to go home and spend at least a few hours with our kids before we put them down. So um, th- it's the fact that I think we're just both on the same page with that that really makes a difference too. Yeah. Um, you know, and Brett, it's, uh, Brett uh, spoke at our open house. We had an open house event uh, uh, last August. And one of the things that uh, I, the, the nicest thing I think he's ever said, and he said a lot of nice things, but this one, this one stuck with me is he said, the most impressive thing about Evan and, and Brian is that is how important they, um, uh, their families are to them. And that, that was a really nice comment from someone that screwed it up yeah. and, and yeah. admittedly, admittedly you know, so. says that he screwed yeah. it up. So, and it's easy to look at guys like that and say, well, you know, we don't really want that. Um, yeah. So it, it, it's, it's, the, it's the way to go. And, and I think uh, you know, having, this, having the support from our wives has been, like we couldn't have done it without it. It would have been business or wife and um, Entrepreneurs yeah. aren't good at making that decision. <laughs> uh, so it's just great that we've had supportive wives all along the way. Um, uh, so, yeah. Can I do a part B then? Yeah. So, obviously, you had a prof warn you about partners, and you all know the value of good partners, but I wonder if there are students here that would know that if you get a good one, the relief it provides you if you do have families. Because my husband has beautiful partners, and it allows us a chance to de stress. So. You know, I know you focus kind of on that. Obviously, find the good ones, but that partnership, how it allows you the that auto- like how you can go off and do your things and and be with your family while you know he's got your back. Or it comes down to trust. Yeah, uh, and, and we've just got so much of it that that we I know Evan's doing what he needs to do. I'm doing what I need to do, and and we also know that I mean I I had uh, our twins were born early. Uh, we had a very complicated pregnancy where that took took us to Toronto, took us to, we probably had 60 ultrasounds uh, throughout our, our pregnancy. So, I mean, I was gone a lot. Uh, and not once did Evan say, hey, Ryan, let's, you know, you're not around enough. Um, it's just unspoken with us that mm-hmm. kids are the most important thing. And it's, yeah. and it's, and it's trust that we also get the work done that we need to get done. Um, you know, because we are, come from that same hardworking kind of guys. And it kind of comes back to Jim's question on what drives us and it, we're, we're not money driven we want to build something but not at the expense of family mm-hmm. and that's just kind of we both have that same that same I guess outlook so that's that that helps as well here dad do you want to can you throw you that throw for me yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a thrower all right thank you uh, I really appreciate that you attribute hard work and choices to have fun because they're not mutually exclusive, they're (laughs) inclusive. Uh, But my question for you is, you were the one of the 11. What happens when you're three of 11? Like you guys said, when you first started out, you got 30K. So your friends possibly were some of the other people. Mm -hmm. So they're now three out of 11. So they've got to uh, travel a different road than you have. Um, so I, I guess the question is sort of where is it, you know, where do you start? How do you get started if you don't get that 30 grand? Well, firstly, 30 grand is not very much money to start a company, uh, especially not a manufacturing company. Um, but it, it's, uh, I mean, I think I, I go back to my top, our top five lessons. And, and if you do all of those things, you're going to get your business off the ground. Um, if you network, you're going to eventually meet someone that wants to be a partner. Um, and, and there's no replacement. I don't care what the idea is. There's no replacement for hard work and perseverance and um, and those things. I, I did the thirty thousand dollars make or break us? No, 
it, it absolutely not. It probably gave us a bit of a kick in the ass. Yeah, we, we were forced to do something. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it, maybe we would have kind of procrastinated a little longer, but I think we still would have found a way to build this business. It might have just we, taken a little longer. Maybe in a backyard or something like that. Yeah. 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 Yeah, go to engineering. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I, actually, my quick, easy answer is don't necessarily uh, make your, the person sitting next to you in your class your partner. Um, you know, one of the reasons that our trio didn't really work out is because one of the three of us didn't really have a role in the company or a different skill set. So I'm a big proponent of, of making someone who has a totally different skill set and outlook uh, as, as your partner. You need to share some common values, and I think hard work and, and the vision for our company is something that we've shared s since day one, which, mm -hmm. is, which is why we get along so well, but um, you need complementary skill sets because in your first few years of business, when you are doing everything yourself, um, you, need, you need people, uh, a team uh, of, and partners that can do those things. So um, not partnering with your best friend who sits next to you every day in class is, is a good place to start. And I, I mean, my advice is, is what I did is go hang out in engineering because uh, that's that's you know that's very different uh, group of people that are hanging out there than than in the walls of the Edwards Business School. Have anything to add? Um, actually, I, um, when we first started this, <laughs> I had, my friend in engineering was part of the team, but oh, he was yeah. he was out like pretty. Much, I, uh, did he make it till we even won? The, or did he leave? Yeah, he did. No, because we gave we, him fifteen hundred bucks. Right, we bought him out actually because <laughs> he was moving to Lloyd and like it was just. So it's it's yeah, find somebody who. Um, is kind of your opposite, but you also have the same same kind of core, I guess. So, because then you can split your work and yeah. We have one last question. Trump <laughs> so that's our it. So that's long. our 10 <laughs> years wrapped up. And uh, you can see um, that you can actually leave the school here and actually create your own job and even make money and stuff like that. So if you, uh, uh, hopefully you've got some ideas and can see where, where they went. So I don't know who's going to be here next year for our guest speakers, but uh, hopefully they'll still be in business. You will be, won't you? <laughs> 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 it's also nice when you can email your partners at 6 in the morning and get a reply back. That's, that's a, a something that you know your investment is safe when people are at it. They do work very hard. So, Anyways, we'll see you next year. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs> <laughs>